rewrite these things and you're like trying to work them out in yourself and then you're like, oh, well, I don't want people to think that I like, think that that's wrong for other, anyway. <sighs> I write because I'm trying to figure stuff out, not because I think I know the answer. That's what I'm saying. Um, I think one more, do I have time? One more, okay. Um, it's I have one that's kind of long, okay. Um, so, oh, this, this got to be an, an honorable mention in the New England Book Awards, and I just found out it's nominated for the Bisexual Book Awards, which is a thing that I didn't know <laughs> was a thing. So, yeah. Two, but this one's pretty long, so I'll do this one, and then we'll see. Thanks, okay. So this is like a, a prose piece, and it kind of gives you like the beginning of the actual plot. Lewis and I never actually slept together, even though we met at the height of the period in my life I refer to as my sexual terrorist phase. <laughs> Luke and I had officially broken up in the fall of 2010 after he downed eight shots of Jack Daniels during one of my shows, jumped on stage during the middle of a skit and announced from his chest voice that I was an ungrateful bitch. After a few weeks of female empowerment beach trips, long back porch heart to hearts that ended with me crashing wine drunk on friends' couches, countless reassurances from Caleb, and lots of yoga, I decided it was time to figure out how to be a proper slut. I spent six months sleeping with everyone, friends of friends on pull-out couches after dinner parties, poetry groupies at out-of-town shows. I found my way into boudoir-lit burlesque ca cast parties and glitter-strewn pan-gender sex clubs. Yes, I made poems out of all of it. Sometimes I told the people in the poems and sometimes I didn't. Once I carried a case of scabies from Owen's bed to the bed of his platonic roommate, Lee. Neither one of them thought the situation was as funny as I did. That became a poem too. I told one of them. I meant to be mindful of everyone's feelings. A couple of times, however, I'd get a text from someone I'd slept with asking me to come with them when they got their LASIK surgery or meet their sister in from Baltimore. And I finally realized how guys must feel when they accidentally hurt girls out of sheer ignorant self-absorption. The way I knew when I'd fucked up was my stomach would hurt. A drinking buddy of mine said once that sex without an emotional connection is masturbation with a friend. I was amazed at how easily I acted out the physical. I was aware how every one of my actions was received. I watched myself make every scratch, every bite and moan. This must be enlightenment, I tell myself. Bright and shiny bodily sex without the dark egoic weight of romance. <laughs> Spoiler alert, when you think you're enlightened, you're never enlightened. <laughs> While all this was happening, Lewis and I began our weird sexless romance. The day after we met, he emailed me the poem I first saw him read, and I sent him my poem, Plates. He wrote back on New Year's Eve, Dear Rick. Something like a year or two ago, in one of my rants about the general guarded dross of academic and confessional poetry, I said to one of my friends that I had just heard some girl at the Cantab read something about dirty dishes and Tibetan burial that was so much better than all that shit, and was not so much the next thing, but was in fact just the thing, that she was better than anything I'd heard at any readings at Harvard or spoken word societies, and this girl had some seriously hot blood that gave me hope. I thought it might have been you, but now I know it obviously is, and it all makes sense now. So thank you. I'll write back more in full later and send you another. See you in the decade fresh. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> write to me and tell me I'm a genius. That's the way, yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we went on, I don't know why, well, okay. We went on a couple of unspoken pseudo dates, but after this email, his relationship with his girlfriend deteriorated and he moved back to his parents' house in Ann Arbor. We continued to email poems back and forth. We called each other friend and managed to shackle the word with innuendo. Late in the spring of 2011, he moved to Connecticut to work at a theater in New Haven. He would call me whenever he came through town, and no matter how tired I was, we would stay up late, late talking and laughing and looking over each other's poetry. When we were in the same room, everything became funny. Sentence structure and words and breathing and being bodies, all of it just absurd. One night, at the beginning of the summer, we processed down to Jamaica Pond post house show with a small group of poets. When we reached the black water shrouded by trees from the urban commercial street, some of us began to peel off our clothes. We waded into the water one by one, gorgeous sinking silhouettes between different shades of dark, pond, trees, sky. We were in the middle of the city, but I could only see stars. 
I was everything and everything was silent and weightless. Lewis stayed on the bank with the two body shy college girls. He told me later it was because he had jock itch, not because he was not fun loving and stargazing. <laughs> Lewis and I only ever kissed once, smoking his Winston's outside Red Bones barbecue late in September. I told him I was tired of struggling and being poor and how I just sold out and taken a real job. He told me I was a poet and I couldn't help but be a poet. And someone else can do the PR for the biggest yoga studio in Cambridge. It was clear at that moment that Lewis should not be another Owen and that the only correct action was to kiss this man. I leaned over and kissed him and it ruined our friendship. That was when I decided I didn't know a thing about romance. I read an article in the New Yorker that said we Americans don't know how to deal with love that isn't either sexual or familial. My polyamorous friends gave me books that said attraction is attraction. It's just situational imposed limits that keep us sometimes from fucking those with whom we share push-pull eye contact or Beatrice benediction. I read a lot that fall. Just before I left, I read an article about how they cleaned all the kisses off of Oscar Wilde's grave. It made my stomach hurt the way it hurt when I was nine and learned about global warming and the atomic bomb. I texted Lewis about it from some bar with an anachronistic overwrought tone of despair. He responded with a deeply poetic blow off. That night, I wrote a poem called Kissing Oscar Wilde. When I told Caleb about the kisses in the grave, we were in his living room about to watch a Woody Allen movie about Paris. We were eating sea salt brownies. I think I must have been almost crying or else my voice must have sounded dead. Caleb has always wanted to make things better for me. He said immediately that he would come meet me in Paris while I was on tour and we could go back to Oscar Wilde's grave and replace my kiss or do something else in response, a statement, a happening, and he would take pictures. I also read how some unmarried born-again Christians become abstinent when they convert, a second virginity, they call it. I thought maybe I'd learned how to love all wrong, and maybe if I recreated the circumstances of my adolescence, I could reprogram that part of my brain. When I arrived in Paris, I'd been abstinent for six months. What happens? Fifteen dollars. <laughs> 